welcome to another episode of Dialogues. My conversation today is with Catherine Page Harden, who's a psychologist working on issues of genetics and inequality. She's decided to walk into that minefield uh, with a new book, The Genetic Lottery, uh, in which she argues that there's an egalitarian case for taking genetics seriously. Uh, Page is a professor of psychology at the University of uh, Texas and is particularly interested in adolescent development and educational outcomes. So along the way, she explains the way in which genetics can influence some of the key life outcomes that we look at a lot in social science, like college completion and so on, and what that means for policy, why the whole nature-nurture debate is completely ill-founded, because obviously they reflect each other. Talk a bit about design of babies, some gender difference points, uh, and also why she believes that there's no application from any of this new gene egalitarian genetics, if I can call it that, for any of the debates about uh, racial inequality. It's a, a lively conversation uh, in a what I think is a really important area and one that we should be taking very seriously. So I hope you enjoy it. Paige Harden, welcome to Dialogues. Thank you for having me. Uh, and congratulations on your new book and for the the attention that it's that's getting. You've put your head above the parapet and you're being, well, a parapet would suggest you're already being shot at from one side, but actually you're being, sh <laughs> you're, you're being shot at from all sides. But this the whole idea of thinking about genetics and inequality is obviously a you know controversial topic, and you knew that you knew that going into it. Obviously, the book's written with that awareness. But how did you? What what was the path that led you? Tell us a bit about your own personal intellectual journey that led you to this being such a fascination for you. Yeah, that's such an interesting question because it was not it was not the you know you walk down a path, but you know you're not quite sure where that path is leading at first, and it was not as if I originally started with the idea of writing a, you know, a controversial book. That wasn't my original intention. So my um, graduate training is in the field of behavioral genetics. And my research is in how genetics and social context influence child development. So um, I'm particularly interested in my kind of home field of research on the transition from childhood to adolescence um, so the emergence of substance use problems, when you start to see people's school performance really start to stabilize, um, their experiences going through puberty, um, their experiences with kind of uh, fertility or childbearing are not. Um, so if you do research in that area, you know, you kind of come to an awareness that you're studying the, the child and adolescent roots of inequalities that then play out for the rest of the adult lifespan. So there was that just as just like my primary focus of scientific research. And then my former PhD advisor, Eric Turkheimer, got a grant from the Templeton Foundation on uh, a very modestly titled uh, project called Genetics and Human Agency. And it was mm. um, tasked with bringing together half behavioral or genetic scientists and half philosophers who mostly focus on philosophy of science, but some people who focus on distributive or retributive justice. And so we spent, you know, two or three years in conferences with scientists and philosophers. So either, after this, you know, my first meeting of this, I thought, well, I'll write a paper. I'll write a paper for a special issue <laughs> for behavior genetics, which is going to be on, um, you know, genetics is luck and how that's related to luck egalitarianism, Rawlsianism. And as I was drafting that paper, someone from Princeton, yeah, University Press approached me and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? Hmm. And I thought, well, no, I haven't. But, you know, it would be kind of nice to have space to describe this. You know, I'm going to have a lot of trouble fitting this into one, you know, 8,000 word <laughs> paper. And, um, and so the project sort of spiraled from there. And as you begin writing and, and you, if you spend any time kind of in public conversation, whether that be on Twitter or doing any sort of science communication, um, you know, I progressively realized, um, you know, how many different conversations there were happening, both on the, the politics side of like, you know, why should we even think about equality, but also on the, like, what does heritability mean? And what is a GWAS? Mm -hmm. And so the book ended up being my attempt to, you know, explain how as someone who's personally cares about social equality and who is professionally invested in understanding the effects of genetics on child development, how I see these issues kind of fitting together. 
I, I love how much philosophy there is in your book. I mean, you've obviously become a little bit of a part-time philosopher. I think you quote, I think, I think <laughs> oh, you quote, you not, quote as, as many, many philosophers as you do geneticists. I mean, it, there's I rules, do, there's dwarfing, I there's, I mean, there's a lot. But let's back up a little bit because you said like, what is a G was a, a minute ago? Um, so I guess my question to you is, okay, what is a G was? Because I think that understanding, first of all, understanding that it's not like there's a gene for that. Uh, uh, yeah. and, and particularly in, most who works in education so talk a little bit about how you would construct what is a GYS and how you would construct it for say an educational outcome and how much roughly kind of what difference uh, it would make so in other words like why are we here why, why should I care yeah uh, and what because yeah. it's really really for me a GYS is a big big difference to the kind of the gay gene or the smart gene or the whatever so in a genome-wide association study kind of a classic one You're looking at people who are not ordinarily considered biological relatives. You're looking at a very large number of them. So in our most recent paper, for instance, we we are pooling data from 1.5 million people. Hmm. All of the people are homogenous with regards to recent genetic ancestry. So their genetic ancestors come from like a circumscribed place in the world. Um, And so often our... Uh, most commonly of exclusively European genetic ancestry, recent European genetic ancestry, um, they would be racially identified as white. And that's important for reasons we can come back to. And so it's against the backdrop of that kind of like homogeneity in, 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 in genetic ancestry, you're looking at differences between people in measured DNA sequence. So I might have a G in one location on my genome, or you, whereas you have a T, and that's a single DNA letter difference between us. And so if we measure, you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of these DNA letter differences between us, we can correlate each one of those with differences in, again, some measured outcome, whether that be height or BMI or years of education. So it is essentially a you know, a brute force data mining exercise of correlation. Um, so what's important about that is um, there's there's opacity regarding whether or not we're really getting at genes causing something versus just being correlated with something. And we can come back mm-hmm. to, you know, how we might resolve mm-hmm. that issue. Um, there's opacity regarding mechanism generally, right? So anything, any, any process that... Orients originates in your genome, but comes to be correlated with this outcome. Um, an example that a real life example we can think of is if my genes affect whether or not I'm a morning person and school starts at 6.30 a.m. and I'm sleepy in the morning and that makes it harder to get through math because that's my first period of class, that's going to pop up to the extent that's consistent across people in your GWAS. Um, and then the third thing is that it's, you know, um, it's never one variant. It's never one gene. It's always thousands upon thousands of variants, each of which have an infinitesimally small effect. So we're not talking about um, genes that operate like Huntington's disease, where you have you know a single variant that has a right. large effect. We're talking about you know a multiplicity of factors, each of which ever so slightly change the probability of an outcome. Um, that collectively are associated with um, a difference in the chances of experiencing, again, being taller or being heavier or going further in school. Yeah. You put them all together, basically, yeah. right? I just want to understand this and then we'll apply it to college. But yeah. the GWAS is essentially like a scraping exercise. You just like, it's a bit, you know, yeah. how you do web scraping yeah. sometimes. So it's yeah. thousands of that. And, but cumulatively, you get lots of information. You put the GWAS together for, say, education. And then, and then you find quite big effects, right? I mean, you have this really nice chart where you show that it's as big as income, for example, in, yeah. in college, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what's so fascinating about it, right? So you do this GWAS, you have this list of correlations, and then you go to a new sample of people and you use those correlations to just add up information about their DNA into a single number. So you get this really kind of um, ugly thing in the sense that it's mechanistically opaque and complex. And... It is as strongly correlated with many of the important social science outcomes as variables we're used to thinking about. So the polygenic index derived from a GWAS of educational attainment is as strongly correlated with rates of college completion as a student's family income is. And I think that is the that is the result that I'm inviting readers to be curious about and take seriously. 
Yeah, and you, we'll get into some of the politics of this in a moment. But I think it's it's a question of then thinking two two thoughts at once. So whilst you show, for example, that so P this polygenic score for the GYS for education looks pretty similar, if you take bottom quintile or quartile P versus income, it's pretty similar. But you also then look at them together and um, and show that actually being high P, in other words, your GYS looks good for education, but you're low income you're less likely to go to college than if you're low P, but from mm-hmm. a high income background. Yeah. And so, yeah. so in, in no way should your your results be interpreted to mean that, oh, okay, in that case, it's don't worry about the income gap in college going. It's all about the, you know, your genes quite the opposite, it seems to me. It's like, well, how not it interesting then that even these kids who their GWAS would predict do well at college, but happen to be born into low income families do less well than the that, than the kids from, from richer families. And in fact, I did a little bit of work on what I call the glass ceiling, the way that rich parents make sure their kids don't fall. There's a phrase yeah, the in, 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 floor. <laughs> in, 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 in so the glass, exactly the glass floor. Yeah, it's, it's rather than a ceiling, it's a floor. And actually, I looked at kids who on an AFQT score, the cognitive score in adolescence, I would have predicted would have been downwardly mobile. And why weren't they? And the answer was because they got a four year college degree. And so it looked as if you really want to make sure that your dumbest kid gets well educated because then the labor market yeah. will take it will take care of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think this is, you know, it's really interesting to me how well those um those results converge what you're seeing with the AFQT versus what you're seeing with the polygenic score. You also see very similar things with twin studies in which um you don't see a lot of um environmental similarity between siblings for measured IQ scores, but you certainly do for achieved levels of education. And I think in combination, it's telling you a lot about how privilege works, right? Like what do affluent parents know they need to do to buffer their children um, from that downward mobility? And, you know, they, they cannot necessarily, um, you know, substantially raise their children's AFQT score, you know, they can by a few points, but like not, you know, hugely, Um, they can't uh, change their children's genes, but they can certainly make sure they get into college, right? And we see that in the US that even parents are willing to do that even through illegal means. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think that that's, you're exactly right, that it's, like holding both of those pieces of information in our head at the same time. We're so used to this rhetoric of nature versus nurture that if you pay any attention to genes, you're necessarily distracting from attention, you know, environmental sources of inequality. Whereas I think the research is telling us that it's both that we, you know, that both of these dimensions are happening. And we're, again, we're used to thinking about this around other dimensions of inequality. I mean, I think one advantage of the kind of rise of people talking about intersectionality is this attention to, well, we can't really understand race unless we are also taking into account gender, right? The experiences of a black woman and a black man are different. We can't take into account income unless we're also taking into account disability status, right? Like someone who is disabled and poor experiences a different kind of combination. And I'm simply saying, not that we shouldn't be paying attention to those dimensions of inequality. Can we add the genome as another way of visualizing inequality that is obviously intersecting with the things that social scientists already care about. And I think the example you bring up of someone who has a certain, you know, um, embodied privilege is one way to think about it in terms of their genome, their experiences are going to be different depending on whether they're coming from a poor family versus a rich family. And what do we get from not the either or choice, but but trying to think about adding layers of information in our understanding of why people's lives diverge? So actually, the idea of adding the genome maybe to thinking about those those intersections is in, is interesting, and it, it actually brings me to I guess one of the reasons for the resistance to this kind of of work. You know, as someone that's done a lot of work in policy, I think our tendency is for those of us who look at the evidence for genetic the impact of genetics and this is you know it's it's not as if you can ignore it if you take the the research seriously i think one of the reasons to look away from it is because it just it's intractable 
it's like there's nothing it, it's more a sense of there's nothing i can do about that anyway <laughs> And so why don't I focus my attention on the things I can do something about, like the learning environment by family income or whatever. So I get it, right? Some of this is about the genome. But as a policymaker, I can't change your genome. And so it sort of feels it's almost like a dis- it's not that it's wrong. It's that it's a distraction. And it's, yeah, it's, in, out, of, and it, and it's out of it, aim. Yeah. Yeah. So why, so why waste time? Why waste time and, and money finding out more about something that I can't do anything about anyway? I think that's the yeah. sort of more, res- that's the responsible reason why people have not looked at this rather than some of the other reasons. Yeah. So I think that's, I mean, I think that that is, is common and intuitive, but wrong for two reasons. So the first is that it, it, positions policy as if policy is only useful to the extent that it improves an individual person's functioning rather than changing the structure to accommodate differences in functioning. So, you know, we can think about accommodations to structures that we see as part of the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? Like let's cut ramps into curbs on sidewalks. Let's add ramps into buildings. That is a policy that is cognizant of difference. It is not saying I, my role as a policymaker is to make sure that everyone is ambulatory. It's saying, given that some people are ambulatory and some people are not for a variety of reasons, and some are genetic and some are accidents and some are whatever, um, what does the structure need? How does the structure need to change so that people are equalized in terms of their ability to participate, to, to engage with each other in relationships that reflect their human dignity? We do that very, very naturally. We think that way in a post ADA world, I think intuitively, um, around physical difference. Um, and so what I'm suggesting that people can consider is, what is the educational analog of that around psychological difference or cognitive difference, right? Um, and we have a little bit of that when we think about educational policy, right? Like my, you know, uh, when we think about what is a public school mandated to do with regards to a child who has ADHD or a child who has speech language problems, which is, a, you know, a personal example that I talk about in the book, mm. um, it's, okay, to what extent can I in that case, attempt to change your functioning, right? We are attempting to improve your speech, but also what accommodations do you need in the classroom, in the discipline structure, in the, like, so, like literally where ch- children sit in the classroom, right? Like they put ADHD children closer to the teacher because it's easier for them. Um, so that is, it's, the scope of policy isn't just changing people, it's changing structures to accommodate people's differences. So I think that's one mm-hmm. kind of um, frame of thinking that I think is incorrect when we think that like genetics is irrelevant to policy. And then the other, it's just this idea that like genes, genes are not destiny, right? Like genes are difference makers. They change the probability of things. They often operate through social and environmental mechanisms that themselves can be changed. Um, So to give you a specific example of this, like if we look at genes associated with teenagers' risks of developing alcohol abuse, you know, one of the ways that genes affect alcohol abuse, your, your likelihood of becoming an alcoholic, is it, you know, changes your brain's response to alcohol. Like, do you like it? Is it rewarding? You know, uh, do you get more of the stimulating effects versus like, it makes you sleepy and tired and want to throw up and go home. Mm -hmm. Um, but part of it is through personality, right? That like teenagers who like, like parties and are really extroverted and like, you know, friends who are kind of wild and exciting are more likely to be exposed to alcohol in the first place. And then the earlier you get exposed, the more likely you already get addicted. Um, so it turns out that one of the ways that you can reduce, that risk is not by tinkering with anyone's biology, but by putting their family in family therapy and that the parents learn how to monitor who is my kid hanging out with. And that doesn't change, again, it doesn't change anything about their genome. It's just breaking this like gene to social environment to phenotype connection. It's like you have the same genes, but you're just less likely, you have a curfew now. And so now Mm -hmm. you are less likely to be around friends who expose you to alcohol when you're 14. 
we know this because there's an RCT of a family therapy intervention where they genotyped their participants. Um, that kind of work is incredibly rare, right? Where we are doing observational social science where we see that genes are connected to phenotypes via this envir these putative environmental mechanisms. And now let's try to push on the environmental mechanism. Can we break that link between mm -hmm. genotype and phenotype? Are we preferentially helping people who are most at risk? That's the part that like that combination to me is really, really exciting. Like in, in some ways, I feel like talking about the like the policy applications seems premature when there's like the research base in which people have actually seen how do genotypes interact with these like exogenous pushes on the environment is so nascent. Like there's so little of that work right now. But the one, yeah, the one, the examples we do have are incredibly exciting. I think. Yeah. So we don't, we don't know, we don't know enough yet to know how much we might know uh, about yeah, about exactly. this. But I, think, but I think it's sort of interesting. I mean, actually, I was looking at something. I, I got a bit fascinated by. Uh, the, I think it's the H seven adjustment on this gene, which makes you more receptive to dopamine. Uh, I think you know, it's, it's in Sapolsky or something. And I was looking at gender differences, and I found this paper which says that there is a this gender difference um, between. Uh, the extent to which this uh, marker predicts risk-taking behavior, it seems to predict it much more in boys, adolescent boys than girls, but that interaction was massively changed by the degree to which there was kind of parental supervision or social support kind of around it. So it was kind of, for me, it was like a really good example of what you're saying, which is like, okay, so if you know that, well, first of all, you know that it's true for boys, but not girls. So it, do, it does mean, actually, you would parent boys a little bit differently around certain things than girls and certainly if you knew that your kid had this this mark, genome marker then that would, it would affect how it did but it but it almost took took away the interaction so you mm -hmm. could change the interaction between gender and this genome by the way you socially engage so i get i get i get all that i think in, in some ways i think it's a more profound challenge to the way we think about policy obviously there's the individualistic one but it's also thinking about <sighs> Very often our goal is to try and get rid of difference. It's to, it, it, we don't like difference. We don't like coefficients between things. We don't, we don't, we're trying to sort of sand it away. We're trying, we want everything to be, and what you're saying is, well, that's not true. This is part of your equity equality versus equality discussion, I think. And you, you can't sand those differences away. And instead you have to find structures that meet those differences and accommodate them. Uh, in various ways. And maybe also rethink what success looks like in, in terms of the outcome. So you're, you're insisting on the importance of difference and the unchanging nature of certain differences rather than saying, oh, there's these horrible differences, let's get rid of them. So you're, in mm -hmm. that sense, you're an advocate for difference being both inevitable and, and something we have to take properly into account in policy and, that, and it is not going to go away. Yeah, I mean, I think that this, this what is the relation between equality and difference, right? That is, that is the really mm -hmm. hard question. You know, equality would be an, a, a less empirically and uh, politically difficult question if everyone were the same, but we're not. Um, I, I, you know, the, the more I think about this issue, the more I appreciate what people in the disability justice movement have brought to the conversation. Because I think in many cases, they have been at the forefront, whether we're talking about the deaf community or the neurodiversity community, um, you know, parents advocating even for, again, back for accommodations for ADHD children in school. It's saying um, there's no difference between us and functioning that makes my life less worth living or makes me less entitled to relating to you as an equal in a way that reflects the dignity of my life. And that is the frame that I want to bring into our conversation about genetic difference, in particular around genetics that are relevant to education. Because I think if we look at the kind of outsized role that, you know, college completion plays in structuring equality of all sorts of other goods, right? Other things that we care about. And then we take this disability justice perspective of like, what are people entitled to um, you know, regardless of difference, in spite of difference, to that, you know, having the traits that are selected for in formal education, 
I think that brings up a new kind of set of questions um, that are different from kind of the usual things that are considered in many of our kind of like nature nurture debates around mm. genetics. Yeah, but there's also this issue which you raised, which is like, I think, challenging the very outcome, the idea that college com- college completion does yeah. bear mm-hmm. heavily, but 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 should it? I mean, you quote Michael Young and his work on meritocracy, which you know, I've used his work mm-hmm. a lot too, and he kind of makes the, you know, there's this, the question at the heart of his critique of meritocracy is, you know, who, the winners determine merit, and you quote Sen saying that. So who gets to decide what's meritorious? Well, guess what? You know, we do. And um, yeah. and so smart people divine, dis, dis, design institutions, including the labor market and education system, to reward, guess what? Smart people. Um, mm-hmm. I'm using smart very loosely here, of course. But that, yeah. you know, that and how do we determine that? Through, through education. And so there is part of this which is about saying, given the diversity that we have in different views, why obsess about college completion rather than saying, how can we use the GWAS, the Peace Corps, to help more people complete college? Another way to interpret this work is, why do, how, how do we take the kind of GWAS to say, why the hell have we designed our society in such a way that everyone has to complete college <laughs> to make it su- successful, given that certain people are going to find that much more difficult? And so it's a yeah. much more, it's a much deeper critique in some ways. Yes. You know, your listeners can't tell that I'm smiling while you're talking, but I'm smiling while you're talking with that particular pleasure of someone articulating back your ideas, maybe more articulately than you said them yourself, which is exactly, you know, you're exactly right. There's a, there's a, there's one level in which I think education is a good, um, more people should have access to the joys of studying things and the way that we study them in higher education. And to the extent that we can use genetics to better design interventions, policies, classrooms, curricula, so that more people can, you know, delight in and enjoy the pleasures of higher education. That is a good. And even if we did that and we maximized everyone's ability to participate in higher education, there will still be differences between us in terms of um, how good we're at it, good we are at it, how much we like it, to what extent that is the sort of labor that we want to engage in. And we are experiencing now in our, you know, para-COVID economy, exactly what happens when you can have you know, one type of work, but not another type of work. I mean, I, but around this book, I, you know, I've written a book about how we can, we can read your genome and read the genome of millions of people. I have difficulty getting the book to people because of supply chain issues that are caused by labor shortages in paper mills, in unloading delivery trucks, right? Mm. Like I, we literally can't get books on paper to people about this incredible technology that tells us something really profound, actually, about how we need many different types of labor, how much the labor of the, you know, the quote unquote cognitive elite is dependent on the labor of everyone else. But that type of labor is not equally valued in terms of, um, you know, building the components of a life without precarity and a life without a sense of security, um, with a sense of security. So, That's, it is a much more radical critique. I think if you take seriously the idea that being good at school does not make you a better or more deserving person, I think that opens the door to like a a number of things that are kind of a more radical critique of the economy. Right. And I I was essentially thinking a bit about, do you know, um, Joseph Fishkin's book? I don't think you saw him, um, Bottlenecks. I've referred to him. No, I don't. Uh, super interesting. I think you'd like it now. Um, he's a uh, he's a philosopher. He's a lawyer, but philosopher. But he he talks about opportunity pluralism, and by that, oh. what he means is is not on, not only that there should be pl- many pathways to some agreed upon measure of success, right? At a certain level of economic security, say, at a certain level of income, but also there needs to be a pluralism in definitions of what of what kind of opportunity you want to pursue, like what yeah. success looks like. And, and actually, I would add to that sort of pluralism around status. It seems that where I think societies probably always go wrong, and maybe our society is much better than others um, in this regard, is if you have too narrow a definition of what success looks like or mm-hmm. what GYs you need to be successful. 
um, and then elevate that, as you say. So you have this nice line about kind of difference without hierarchy, and then that's a hierarchy. So right now, a GWAS that gets you a four-year college degree, great. In Sparta, a couple of thousand years ago, probably you know being a man having good upper body strength and high risk mm-hmm. tolerance w- was good in renaissance it's, I, I don't know but you could kind of multiply examples of where different kind of gwas was going to be successful the key thing is not to have too unitary a structure yes. is not to narrow it so it's to have as much diversity as possible in the kind of different gwas combinations lead to and not to elevate right so not to say yeah. great you're really good at fighting you can be the you can be the leaders oh great you're really clever you can be the leader or great you're really good at gardening or something you can be. but instead to say look we've got lots of people who are really good at lots of different things yeah let's find yeah. a way not how do how do we find a way not to elevate one of them above the other right yeah there you know in which you know, i think that is the the one problem is that i could write a i could write a book in which I'm mostly talking about genetics related to education, education, you know, getting through systems of formal education. And that, that is a book about social inequality because so much of income and labor market outcomes, but also relationships of prestige and the sense of thinking of yourself as having a good job versus a bad job depend on education. Whereas if, you know, it's, if, if, it were less f- f- kind of f- we stacked less on it, right? If it were less freighted yeah, with st- practical if, if, import, if the, sta- if the stakes, stakes were lower. If the stakes were lower, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah <Right>. exactly. <laughs> you know, and so so my son is um, my son has like no disgust sensitivity, right? And I have a lot of it. So he will, um, you know, he will, he's constantly he's like a cat. He's like constantly catching bugs and bringing them into the house for me. He's you know he's a nine year old boy. So he's, you know, we're at the farmer's market and he picks up a cockroach and he's holding it in his hand. He goes, look, mommy, I've caught you something. And I just kind of scream and I say, drop it. And he drops it. And then he squishes it and he picks it back up dead. And he goes, it's dead now, mommy. It's fine. And I know you're holding a dead squish cockroach. And so I was talking about this with my, and he's also very kind of like, mechanically inclined you know like he wants to know how things work he's a taker a parter he's a you know on his birthday we asked him to make a wish and he was like i wish to make machines um and so my partner and i were having a conversation like as as parents do about like well you know what what where is this going like what is he gonna what job is he gonna do and i said you know i feel like he would be an amazing plumber because he does not care, like he doesn't freaking care about like things being gross. And he loves like taking things apart and putting them back together and mm. fixing them. And my partner said, oh, but your parents would be so disappointed. And I thought that's, that's the problem right there. There you go. Right? That there's, there's a, there is a form of labor that would be very well suited for his temperament and his interests and that is very secure financially and like will never be outsourced, but that we don't respect as appropriately prestigious for the child of a college professor to do. And it, it's, it, it's that hierarchy of like prestige and status and esteem, what we think of as a dignified profession that I right. think is deeply problematic about the, the, the role that higher education plays in America. Yeah, and I think. And I like the way you frame it, which is 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 realistic in the sense of like this is a system we've got and it's not going away, and so we should try and help people succeed within it. But at the same time, we should be trying to reduce the extent to which that system is the sort of marker and predictor of success, and the system through which success defined that way is replicated mm-hmm. across generations. Because then, of course, you just get all the kind of opportunity hoarding you just described. I actually re- always really like the fact that Arthur Brooks, who used to run. AI, who said his own very interesting journey. Um, he was a college dropout and then a musician. And uh, but he, he, one of the things I really admire about him, he goes out of his way to talk at least as much about his son, who is a who works on a farm, mm-hmm. um, as he is about the ones who are at Vassar or know, whichever college they're at. Yeah. Right? And and yeah. he posts pictures. He, get, he goes to visit his son, and his son drives him around on the combine harvester and stuff. And mm-hmm. and actually, I really admire. I really admire the fact that he's kind of he's doing that. And I felt I have I have a son kind of similar. 
to yours, I think, in terms of you know their their uh, inclinations. But it does actually bring me to a question I wanted to ask you. We'll get to we'll get to race in just a moment because we, we obviously mm-hmm. can't avoid that, and and you do not avoid the question of race here. But what about what about sex? That's that mm-hmm. is pretty much missing from from your book. And I thought, and I'm doing a lot of work in this space myself now. I wondered if it's just because there's only so many fronts in the culture war. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. it's a bit like you can't fight a two you can't fight a fight five front war um and so did you just decide yeah i i, I can't do that because I, there were a number of points where i was reading about the adolescent stuff and because i'm reading quite a lot about this myself and i was like i kept saying yeah but there's big sex differences here yeah but there's big sex differences yeah here. that's so, um, and a lot of these so things too so was that was that a conscious editorial choice or? you know it's not entirely so part of it is just when we're thinking about you know, the, what we see from twin studies or GWAS studies or polygenic score studies um, of educational attainment, there is not on the genetics side, a huge sex differences story. So, you know, the more, most, like the next iteration of the educational attainment, GWAS is, um, I think, about to be accepted into a journal and they do a little bit more looking at things on the X chromosome that are associated with, with um, educational attainment. But if we're looking at, like, if you, you know, if you do a sex-specific GWAS and you look at what are the genetic variants associated with going further in school for girls versus boys, um, those two things are, are very highly correlated to, the, to almost unity. So there doesn't seem to be, like, on the level of the genome in terms of interaction with biological sex, a big story there. So that was part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, where you do start to see things that are interesting is say, take the educational attainment polygenic score and look at it in relation to college completion in men and women across the 20th century. I talk about this. I think I talk about, yeah, mm-hmm. I do. I talk about the you study do. by Pamela Hurd in the book Yeah, where you basically see that, you know, the polygen, the genetic variants that are associated with education now we're not that associated with going further in college for women early in the 20th century because they weren't allowed to go to college, right? And so it's like this, you know, it's back to like, why is gene, why is genetics at all relevant for policy? Like we can actually see the effects of policy in terms of the genetic associations. Like as women have greater access to college, the genetic association actually goes up, right? Which is also, I think, illustrating a kind of a counterintuitive finding that like often you see stronger genetic effects in better, um, more improved policy uh, regimes more, compared to more, more aggressive More ones. open societies. Right? More where open can, societies, where, generally. That way, where you can see. So yeah, it's, that's as a marker of success, right? The extent to which genetics predicts outcomes is a marker of success. It means you're living yeah, it's in more of a... a, it's a, a yeah, it's a marker that like you haven't like you know, there's kind of a totalitarian leveling down, right? In which you've like, you've closed off opportunity. And so, you know, nothing about the individual is correlated with their outcome. Um, so yeah, so in that way, like, we also see evidence of this in the US that like, you get the highest heritability of cognitive ability in high SES families versus low SES families. Um, I think the gender story is a lot more complicated when we're talking about non-cognitive skills because you see bigger sex differences in personality than you do in executive function or processing speed or things like that. Um, so when we're talking about like agreeableness versus disagreeableness, um, you know, uh, and how that is related to occupational selection, I think though it's you know in some ways it's a similar. story. I end up coming back to a similar sort of framework, which is that, you know, many of our conversations about whether or not there are quote unquote innate or natural sex differences in the sort of personality traits that lead you into different occupations, systematizing, you know, versus, uh, you know, being empathy and being interested in Mm -hmm. people. All of those conversations would be less fraught if we valued care labor more right like (laughs) like you know we we care about who's in stem because we pay people in stem more than we can pay child care workers and like we can't actually have stem workers without a child care economy right so like let's pay child care workers what they actually like deserve in terms of their contribution to the economy and i think a lot of our conversations about like are men and women naturally different and like whether or not they care for other people like a lot of the toxicity would be drained out of that conversation 
Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's interesting, actually, that the there is this called the gender STEM paradox, which has been criticized, but I think holds up in the end, which is that in more gender egalitarian countries, you actually see fewer women going into STEM. Um, and I think it may well be because the alternatives are just better paid and, and more respected. Um, and so it, so it takes some of that, the pressure off it there, off there. But one more thing on, on the sex difference, because I'm interested in it, is in the difference of timing. So I think one of one of the things that gets lost a little bit here is is that even if you see sim- similar you know, predictive power within men and within women from their peace score, for example, for educational uh, out- outcomes, I think what's missing there a little bit is the difference in the timing of the of the development. And so I, I think that's you know for me it's the, it's what's the difference between a 15 year old girl and a 15 year old boy uh, and a 16 year old because that's a pretty important point in mm-hmm. the educational journey and there i see quite big differences so for me it's less of, and, and and then the boys will maybe catch up but but it seems to me that it's like it's I, i'm less interested in the overall sex differences than i am in the differences than timing of, of yeah, development yeah and, you know and i like i have an old paper on this where we look at trajectories of impulse control and sensation seeking in in adolescent males and adolescent females and basically like you see a huge gender difference around Mm. the ages of, you know, between 14 and 18 in terms of impulse control and sensation seeking, which matches everything we know about like, you know, it matches data from non-human animals. It matches data on like timing of, uh, you know, prefrontal cortex to amygdala connections and how testosterone affects those. Like, you know, it's not surprising to anyone who's ever spent time with like teenagers at all. Um, What's interesting to me, and again, this it always comes back to like our goal is not to change like an evolved psychology of, of male adolescents. Our goal is to design structures that take that 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 psychology seriously. Like when I was looking for daycares for my yeah. children, you know, you go and you tour daycares, and two you know, the 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 um. The administrators are always eager to tell you, like, well, this is what a two-year-old is working on developmentally. And they want to do things on their themselves. They're working on autonomy and they're working on choice. And so this is how we've structured our day. And this is how we've structured our physical environment to take those developmental needs seriously. We do not do that for teenagers at all. Like, high schools do not take the developmental needs of teenagers seriously at all, particularly male adolescents. And so we have, like, a crisis, I think, in you know, young male adolescents feeling like they have structures that don't hate them, but like take their developmental needs seriously. Um, so like it's, you're, you're seeing a theme here with every frame. It's like, how can we take, how can we observe differences in functioning, both physical and psychological? And then how can we orient ourselves not to changing people, but changing structures so that people can succeed in them? Yes, I think that's be- beautifully put. So people can't see me smiling at you, but that's <laughs> that's going that's going straight into my book on on boys and men. Let's uh, let's move uh, to race. I think largely mm. to to again put it to one side, which I think you successfully do. But it's inevitably the question that gets raised. I know you've talked a lot about this, and my my summary of, of your your view. I'll summarize what I think is your view, and then I'll ask a question. So summarize your view, which is to say that. We we know a lot about how GWAS scores and so on kind of affect individuals uh, and on certain kind of outcomes. We absolutely cannot extrapolate from those individual differences and then start putting them into groups. We can't glob people together into these groups and then take individual differences and say in any way that they are kind of apply to to groups. And mm-hmm. and, and that's the fundamental kind of you know, ecological fallacy the the some hereditarians mm-hmm. would fall into. And you quote Charles Murray and others doing that. And I basic I basically. I think that's I think that's right. Um, so, first of all, it, so have I characterized your position correctly? And then, secondly, yeah. if that's right, yeah. so yes, is that is that right? Basically, yeah, yeah, that is correct. Okay, and then, but then one notes. Well, at least I saw in some of your you, and you said this at the beginning. A lot of the work is conducted within ancestrally similar mm-hmm. groups, mm-hmm. which means like that's but that's one of the reasons why we can't say more about other groups so there's something of a vicious circle going on here which is Definitely. on the one hand i'm saying race but i'm, I'm just going to look at white i'm just going to look at european ancestry people because that just makes it easier and that then allows you to say oh so i can't apply any i, I don't know if this applies to african-americans 
and I can't do group based analysis. So it feels a little bit too convenient in some ways, if I can push you a little bit on that. Yeah, so I think there's a couple different intersecting issues here. And I think vicious circle is exactly correct. You know, one issue is exactly what you were saying, which is that, you know, individual differences within a group don't aren't informative about the nature of group differences. And this is like the, the classic analogy of like, you look over here in this garden, it has great soil, it has great light, it has great water. You observe that plants differ in their height because of their genetics. And then you look over here at this other garden that's been, you know, systematically discriminated against for decades, if not centuries, you know, poor soil, poor nutrition, poor light, and the plants are all short. And you're like, oh, well, it must be because they're genetically shorter over there. Like that doesn't make any sense at all. And it's obvious why that comparison is wrong when we're talking about plants. But people are really tempted into it when we're talking about people. Um, the other problem is that, the, you know, this is an international research community where many of the major uh, sources of data have been from outside the U.S. They've been the U.K. Biobank. They've been Icelandic registries. They've been the Dutch twin registry. They've been, the, you know, the Australian twin registry. And those have preferentially studied and been studied by the investigators too, people of Northern European genetic ancestry. This is, this, I mean, this research landscape is changing so rapidly. Um, and, you know, we're seeing in the research community, like there's going to be the NIH All of Us study. There's the Million Veterans Program, which is, um, you know, genotyping American veterans, many of whom are people of color. There's increasing attention on the part of um, private direct-to-consumer genetics companies like 23andMe to give research grants for the study of particularly African-American populations. So I think the wealth of data that is about to come down the pike in terms of, uh, you know, genomics of non-European ancestry populations is going to be really large. Where that is going to be, I think I think there's going to be a couple of things that come out of that. And one of them is going to be this increasing attention towards what people call um, multi-ancestry, you know, GWAS, right? Genetic analysis in combination with using family members, which is also incredibly important if you're trying to disentangle genes from environments, because you, you know, can, can capitalize on this um, randomness of genetic inheritance within within family members. And the combination of those two things, the multi-ethnic genetic analysis and the within-family genetic analysis, I think are going to really transform our knowledge of which of these genes are operating via um, environmental processes that are uh, contingent on like racial, racialized social processes. So they'll give you an example, like, hmm. you know, um, boys who are slightly disagreeable, who are white, like, you know, don't go as far in school, but they make more money. Like boys who are slightly disagreeable and risk taking, but who are children of color are like penalized and disciplined and like shunted both out of the labor market and Mm. education. So you can have like, you know, a genome to personality thing that's operating very consistently across populations, but then there are these racialized social processes that are operating differently. Um, So I think we're going to see a lot more work like that, which is like, to what extent, again, like, this is an intersectional perspective, like, to what extent is there like, there's your genome affecting your brain, but then your brain is in a body that has a skin color and that has a phenotype that's responded to in this racialized environment. How is that playing out differently? I think we're going to see a lot more work moving in that direction. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's super interesting. And I suspect also is the uh, where's the question as samples get bigger you can start to see more differences kind of within big populations as well i'm thinking about mm-hmm. a paper that caroline hoxby who's a uh, a, a a a controversy immune economist as she put up a, a map of an attempt to look at cognitive skills by region within the us and as you could just see appalachia mm-hmm. basically as low scoring right and so it wasn't it wasn't quite i mean as a colleague of mine said so did she just put up a chart showing where all the dumb and smart people live and and obviously she didn't label it that way. It was like advanced cognitive skills by by 
broad up region, but you did see these kind of areas. And so I can imagine a world where you get big enough data sets, you start to see that there are subgroups even within certain ancestry groups. Oh, 100%. Where you're seeing very different right. Sites. The, right. I and mean, different you see predictability this in, as well. Yeah. There, like um, Abdel Abdelloui wrote, wrote a paper that did a very similar thing, but around the educational attainment PGS in UK, where you can see you know, coal mining regions in the UK have lower average educational attainment, um, genetic variants. Like what I find Mm. so interesting about that is there are people who really embrace this leaving, striving, rising narrative around meritocracy, which necessarily in our economies involves migration. But then when they see if there are leavers, there are also stayers. If there's migra- migration, there's necessarily selective migration. And then a residue of that, then it feels um, like defaming in some way of people. But they're two sides of the same coin, right? Like we can't have a, a narrative of, of, we can't have an entire rhetoric around like leaving and striving if we're not paying attention to like who's not leaving and who's, who is remaining in areas. Um, so in some ways I like that type of work because I think it, it shows up the kind of pernicious underbelly of a lot of our like meritocracy narratives. Yes, I, I agree. And I'm, I'm actually put in mind of some of the work around sort of so-called kind of model minorities and stuff on immigration, right? I don't know if anyone's uh, looked at this, but my, and I've written a bit about this, my view, uh, comparing immigrants to another, to a kind of racial category within an indigenous population is just a colossal error because they're, because immigrants are self-selected. And I've always thought they were self-selected on all kinds of grounds, um, you know, they're willing to go further, they're more motivated for their kids, they're more risk, whatever. But I'm also now thinking, there's almost certainly some going to be some genomic differences too, right between the people who take the risks and the journeys of, say, becoming, you know, leaving Mexico or China or somewhere to come to the US and those who choose not to do that. And yeah. so there's probably some, do you know, has anyone done any work on that? Does that so does I that can think of two things that are very consistent with that. And first is um, a paper by Dan Belsky, who's a Columbia now, where they were looking mm-hmm. at the Dunedin birth cohort, which was this really interesting study of a cohort of a thousand people who were all born around the same time in Dunedin, New Zealand. And they looked at an earlier generation of the educational attainment polygenic score in relation to who left New Zealand. And you see, higher EAP, basically EAPGS predicts leaving. Um, And then our work, we did something on, okay, so part of the genetics of education is the genetics of uh, IQ test performance, right? Like, because we gate education according to, we don't call them IQ tests, but like they are, right? Like an SAT or a PSAT or a GRE. So we gate education by IQ test performance. So obviously part of the genetics of education is IQ test performance. What's left over and part of the genetic variance that's left over is related to what personality psychologists call openness to experience, which is just like, do you like novel things? Um, do you, are you willing to try new things? Like how much do you like um, novelty over sameness? And that, I think, in an Amer- particularly in an American context, is this really underappreciated component of education, right? Like people who do a lot of higher education in the U.S., move around a ton and in so doing like change neighborhoods and friend groups and are willing to live far away from their mothers and have children far away from their biological relatives and how much we have waited in the way we construct formal education openness to new experiences as like a personality trait that like makes you even willing to do that in the first place and so like, I don't think that's about something sort of like inherently more educable. I think that's about like, if you could, you know, I went from Memphis to Greenville, South Carolina, to Virginia, to Boston, to Texas. When I was on the faculty job market, I was deciding between like Alberta, Miami, and Austin, right? Like most people live, you know, like what, like the average American lives 17 miles from their mother, right? Like, and we have constructed a higher education system where you move all over the place. Yep. So we've created this correlation with openness yes. to experience. And then we see evidence of it when we look at it 
in retrospect with our GWAS specification. It's, yeah, it's, it's a great example of how this kind of cuts both ways, right? The outcome measure, uh, how you measure success, kind of driving mm-hmm. what the GWAS. In fact, I had uh, Jennifer Morton on uh, a little while ago, and she's done a lot of work on the kind of price of, of upward mobility. But I, I want to turn last to this question of designer babies to use the, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know, the, <laughs> the country because you you base a lot of your your thinking on the idea of a lottery and of mm-hmm. course that is very rules rulesy and and mm-hmm. the work on luck egalitarianism is look look, look i i don't deserve my luck uh and part of, and, I, and my genes are luck and so if i do better as a result of my genes then i don't deserve those that whatever mm-hmm. come whatever good things come to me and so they are open to redistribution in, in, in some way. That's the basic thesis, but it presumes lottery. And actually you have this very interesting, which and very interesting story of a colleague of yours, I think, who's having a, a child and he and his partner or husband are going to have one E and they, they, so they fertilize a bunch of em- embryos. And so they have a bunch of embryos and, and you're saying he, you say something like he has no intention of using his knowledge of polygenic scores to select, select embryos. And I just immediately Right. Why not? <laughs> why, yeah. Like, why, why, why wouldn't you do that? And why won't people do that once they're able to? And in fact, the danger then is it adds to the inequality that you've talked about. And in fact, Michael Young's son, who doesn't really agree with his dad about yeah. meritocracy, wrote, uh, wrote an article saying, when, when we're able to select our embryos for intelligence, we should only let poor people do it. We should forbid rich people from doing it. Because they'll all do it, and it'll just make it. We should only let people who are poor choose their embryos, because that will be egalitarian. So it's a kind of crazy proposal, but but it sharpens the point about what will actually happen. Of course, is the opposite: is that people like your friend will do it. You mentioned what upper middle class Americans are willing to do mm-hmm. to get their kids well educated. The idea that upper middle class Americans won't choose the embryo that has the best P score for educational mm-hmm. success. I mean, it's, it's unthinkable they wouldn't do that. Yeah. And so that, and that would just make things worse. So, oh gosh, there's so many different considerations going on here. And you're right that my book, especially because I, you know, I wrote the bulk of my bulk of my book in 2019. And I knew that the, you know, what is happening with pre-implantation embryo selection and diagnosis is moving so quickly that. Um, you know, the book is really focused on genetic differences that arise by chance versus choice, which I think will be the vast bulk of genetic differences for people <laughs> for a long time sure. to come. And I think it's important to remember that even when you're selecting embryos, you are, for most people, they're selecting embryos amongst what's already happened with their natural lottery, right? So it's like, you know, they create eight children, eight embryos, and then they mm-hmm. select one of them, but you're, you're selecting within family. You're, it's like, you know, you have eight Powerball draws and you pick the best one, but you're not designing which numbers you get, which is a slightly different thing. Right. So. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But you also, you, you, you do show that siblings vary as, can vary yes. as much as each other as two yeah. random strangers. So <laughs> these two embryos. These two yeah. embryos are going to have... So I've got eight embryos. I've got a lot of genetic variation. Yeah, you have a lot of genetic variation to pick from. So, you know, in this conversation, a couple things I feel like get lost, um, which is on the one hand, you're not selecting... We have to remember the mass of polygenicity here. There's no such thing as selecting for intelligence or selecting for educational attainment without also selecting for any number of other things that are correlated with that in potentially like undesirable or off target ways. So, you know, we write in our paper, we find in our paper on the genetics of non-cognitive skills that, you know, genes associated with going further in education above and beyond cognitive ability are also associated with elevated risk of autism, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. So if we're talking about, well, obviously you would select, you know, for education, obviously you would select against schizophrenia. Well, what do you do about the fact that like there's a non-trivial number of genetic variants that work in both of those directions? So I think, you know, when we're talking about complex behavioral traits, the magnitude of benefit that you would get for selecting within families relative to picking an embryo at random combined with the risk for off-target selection effects for 
things that most parents won't select for, such as like a risk for serious mental illness, I think makes the comp, like, I think it makes the calculation a lot more difficult, like setting aside any of the other objections that people might have, which are considerable, like, and you know, you as a parent have decided this is what you want to do. I don't actually think it's like a clear cut choice because of this massive polygenicity and because of the complex web of, of genetic correlations. Um, so you're saying it's, so you're saying it's going to be hard. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, so that's well for now, but of course the better yeah. you get at your job, then the easier it will get. But also I think that, um, uh, and of course, there's a lot of work going on in this space, as you know, to try and get ahead of this uh, ethically. Because, mm-hmm. look, I mean, like I, I, an example would be SAT prep uh, doesn't work. Yeah. Um, basically, but, but it's... But people a, still have a market for it. Yeah, right. Ma- massive, massive, right? And so yeah. it doesn't matter how many studies... You, you can t- keep telling yeah. people. No, it's no, not no, no, totally true. I mean, like, I think, <laughs> like, if you sell... You can sell rich parents lots of things that they think you know, that like aren't actually scientifically effective. I think the other consideration that's getting, that often gets really lost in these conversations. Um, that's really salient to me. It's really salient to me because I live in Texas, I think. And, you know, we have had, you know, I, we're like, I live in a place where you like, you can't legally get an abortion after six weeks of pregnancy. Um, the, the subject of, of abortion is so fraught that like when I was pregnant, my own OB guy and brought up the idea of, you know, um, chromosomal testing for a fetus with great gingerness and trepidation. Like you don't have to do this and don't get offended that I'm suggesting it, but you know, you could. So I feel like intuitively that's made me a little bit skeptical of these claims that everyone is going to like, like everyone is going to run off and like, do IVF for the sake of pre-implantation embryonic screening. Um, because the reality on the ground is that like the, the pendulum is swinging the opposite it's direction. Going the other way. You're the worried other about way the in terms of like yeah. reproductive medicine. And, and in fact, if you, you know, I was, um, I was raised evangelical Christian. And so I still keep, keep kind of like one foot in like listening to like what's happening in the evangelical community in terms of conversations. And they're also talking about polygenic scores and implant, you know, pre-implantation embryo screening. Um, But part of their larger effort to say that like we should outlaw IVF. Like I think it's actually much more likely that Texas will outlaw IVF than it will that everyone starts having IVF to, to conceive their children. I like in terms of like dystopian outcomes that people can come up with. Um, I think we're seeing, uh, you know, like I, I think we're seeing a backlash towards the exercise of any reproductive rights more than we're seeing the like wholesale embrace of IVF amongst women who are capable of conceiving a child, like, the old fashioned way. Yeah. Well, we, we, we might, we might see it happening in New York, but not in Texas. Uh, yeah. of course. So there could be, you could see difference. One thing that's interesting, you've, you I didn't know that about your religious background. I think one thing the religious faiths, particularly the Judeo Christian tradition do have going for them is this sense of, you know, each life being unique and sacred and valuable, uh, just in and of itself, just in a, in, in, in you know, as a result of being created, um, and they would, you know, it would say in the image of God, then that just that's that's just great and of equal moral value. And so that actually is something that, you know, properly applied. That's the Judeo-Christian theology, I think, speaks to what you've been talking about throughout this conversation, mm-hmm. which is the inherent, which is the inherent dignity and moral equality of every individual in not not despite their difference, but precisely because of their difference. Yeah. I I mean, I agree with you that I think that that is a, you know, to the extent that there is a, um, you know, the parts of my worldview that have like continued to be shaped by my religious upbringing, even though I'm no longer in the church, I think that's definitely one of them. The sense of um, like radical equality of human dignity. Um, and also the sense that like my parents used to say things like, like, um, that sort of in retrospect, I realized kind of like highlighted like the arbitrariness of your talents. Like my mother is very short and she would always joke. She was like, I was in the bathroom when God was handing out height. Like this idea that like, you know, like you got things like, like, 
and it was just arbitrary and you like don't take credit for them right and you know um but it wasn't just height it was like you have this idea of like you know you got talents and you don't deserve them like therefore like they are not they didn't make you better like you're supposed to apply them for like the good of God's kingdom and I think that's a part of my kind of moral outlook on life that's definitely left over um where, where I would criticize the American church now is in going beyond lip service towards equal dignity of every people and towards and like failing to invest sufficiently in um, in building the material conditions and the social conditions that allow people to live a life that reflects that equal inherent dignity. I think, you know, um, uh, on earth as it is in heaven, I think is like a, mm. a phrase that we should take seriously if we're thinking about this idea of equal worth. We can't just say it. We have to do it. Yes, along with God-given talents and there but for the grace of god you know, go i i mean you're right there's a certain there is uh, something to that so well i will uh, i will i'll let you go because i'm sure you have <laughs> other pressures on your on your time but i but i want to congratulate you again on the book it's um uh it's bracingly honest and actually i think your attempt to find find the egalitarian case for taking genetics seriously uh, is long overdue um, and, and I think makes best use of the kind of philosophical tradition in this space. But obviously it's gotten you some attention. Um, <laughs> so so congratulations on that too. And that, But that can also be difficult too. What's next for you if you just have a couple of minutes, just like what's, what's on your agenda now? You know, that is such a good question. Um, I think I might write another book. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I, the all the rational part of me says that's a bad idea, but that's you know I I um I have ideas that I can't get out of my head, and so I think that will probably be a big part of it. And um, I think the other thing is I'm really interested, and I don't know the form that this is going to take. Um, there's doing your own studies and writing your own papers, but then there's building infrastructure so that more people can do the sort of studies that you see as important and game changing. Um, for me, the infrastructure that seems really important right now is this connection between people who are doing RCTs or policy evaluation studies that are studying the lotteries of environment in combination with within family studies. So the lotteries of birth, there are too few platforms that allow you to combine those sources of information. And so thinking about um, how to build those infrastructures rather than kind of single investigator projects is, is something that I've been thinking a lot about these days. Right. Well, we'll, we'll be watching your work um, <laughs> closely, but congr congratulations again. And thank you so much, uh, Paige, for coming on. Thank you for having me. This is delightful. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.